I did a video a couple of weeks ago that was based on a seminar that took place organized by the Outline of Political Economy. I was talking on socialist planning and the environmental crisis. Because of time constraints, I was only able to cover about half of the material I had. So I'm doing the second half of it as a standalone video. And this is about looking from the standpoint of planning at just what the costs of decarbonisation would be, taking just the UK economy as an example. Obviously, similar calculations can be done for any other economy. Now, there's a tendency of people to underestimate what the real costs of decarbonisation were going to be. And the point is that if real costs were faced, there's no alternative but to move to a substantially command economy with major state planning. And for obvious reasons, liberal economists want to play this down because it has unfortunate political um, consequences from their point of view. Now let's start off by looking at what the remaining emissions that the world's allowed if we're to stay within the two degree centigrade limit. Now, as I showed in my last talk, even if you stay within the two degree centigrade limit, if we stay in the low 400s um, parts per million um, of CO2, we're talking about a Pliocene climate with no ice on Greenland, much higher sea levels. So it already has severe effects. But let's look at this. The IPCC took as their base year the 1860 or so. They then give estimates of the cumulative carbon emissions that have occurred since then and the cumulative emissions going forward that would keep temperature rises below 2 degrees centigrade. Now, because any of this is done with modelling and because there's uncertainties in any modelling, there are probabilities attached to their estimates. In 2011, they estimated that there were 515 gigatons of carbon emitted already. Average emissions um, in the time going for forward are about 10 gigatons a year. And from this you can work out what the remaining allowance is by them saying what the total amount that could be emitted to keep the temperature below 2 degrees centigrade, looking at the amount that's been used so far and the rate at which it's being emitted at the moment, roughly 10 gigatons a year. And they then say, if you are going to have a 66% probability that you'll stay below 2 degrees centigrade, the total emissions can't be above 790. If, it's, if you want a 50% probability that you'll be safe, it's, you could emit 820. And if you only want a third probability that you'd be safe, you could emit 900. And according to the estimate you give of the um, amount, total amount that could be put out, the remaining allowance varies. So these are my calculations of the remaining allowance. And this is the number of years that you could have at the current emission level. Now, even to be two thirds safe, you've only got 16 years left. So that we're talking about 2037. In the worst case, you go on emitting at the current level to just before then and cut off rapidly. So by, you cut off by 2038. Now that's the worst possible case because it, it's really not very feasible to cut it off sharply like that. The best case would be a gradual cutoff and then you end up 2053, the world's 
carbon free. And that's basically the, the strategy that the UK government is going for. They set a target of being carbon free by 2050. I think that's rather unrealistic that you should actually plan to be carbon free by the cutoff date because there will be wide divergences in the degree to which different countries decarbonize. Unless you aim to decarbonize fast, there'll be other countries that decarbonize more slowly and the overall gain target of 2050 wouldn't be achieved. So in what follows, I'm aiming for decarbonization by 2037, just to see what that would actually mean. Now, if you look at Europe, currently 72% or well, it's probably down slightly now, around 70% of European energy comes from fossil fuel sources. And it's down a little bit from 2025. If you look at the UK, the situation looks a bit better. The British government put out a statement last year saying last year Britain went for more than five months in total without using coal to produce electricity. In May it went for a fortnight in one stretch, the longest coal-free period since the 1800s. Well, why did they choose 1800? Well, that's when they started making electricity. The plot to the, the right here shows the fossil fuel. Coal is bl dark blue there. Uh, oil is red. Orange is gas. So, and from then on, it's various types of carbon-free emissions. Nuclear is green, orange is hydro, wind is, is light blue, bioenergy is this other shade of blue, and then imports, which is electricity coming over cables from France, which is nu generated nuclearly. So only if, if you view it as a clock, only from 12 to 5.30 is, is fossil fuel. So that looks pretty good. Now, how, how did they achieve this? Well, basically, they achieved it by shifting to natural gas combined cycle power plants. This shift started at the point when Britain had produced a lot of natural gas from the North Sea. Secondly, they've done it by expanding wind and solar power. And thirdly, they've done it by converting the old coal stations to burning mainly biomass, um, mainly wood chips. Uh, wood waste. There's some question as to whether this is really from sustainable forestry, but let's leave that aside for now. Now, why was the shift to natural gas effective? Well, first point is it's thermally a lot more efficient. A natural gas power plant uses what is basically a, a, an aircraft engine, a jet, a gas turbine which compresses the air, burns the fuel, the gas turbine then drives a generator. But the exhaust from a jet engine is hot. So they feed the exhaust through what's basically a boiler and boil water and also drive a steam turbine. So they get two bites at the, the cherry really. An ordinary power plant just has the boiler and the steam turbine. By putting a gas turbine in front of the combustion of the um, natural gas, they get two attempts at getting energy out of it and have a much higher or substantially higher thermal efficiency. And secondly, methane releases a large part of its energy by oxidizing hydrogen rather than oxidizing carbon. So there's less carbon dioxide release per joule of heat produced. But it's still a temporary measure, since burning methane still releases carbon dioxide, even if less than with coal. And all fossil fuel emissions have to be re replaced, in my assumption, within at most 30, within at most 30 years in the um, 
the government plan. I'm trying, I will later present costings for doing it faster than that. But electricity is only half the story. If we were just using electricity, we would be more than halfway to carbon neutrality. But it only makes up a fraction of total energy use. There's also energy used in vehicles, aircraft, for domestic heating, for process heating, etc. The produ production of bricks requires the burning of natural gas in the kilns. Similarly, if you're producing concrete, you, um, you need natural gas to provide the heat to sinter the, the concrete, so, or sinter the limestone. So taking as a whole, the economy as a whole, only 23% of energy came from renewable sources. Now, this is not just electricity, but the whole economy. So there's coal, this is oil. Now, it's, now that's huge. Whereas very little oil is used to make electricity. A lot is used for transport. Then here's gas, and it's a bigger percentage than before because it now includes the gas that's used for process and domestic heating. And just this section, say from 9.30 to, to midnight, is green. So the situation is much worse when you look at total energy usage. The implications are you must co close down all the remaining coal, oil and gas power stations. Then you've got to build enough nuclear and wind ones to replace other energy uses, to replace energy uses in heating people's houses, transport, and industrial process energy. Now, it's worth, you have to go through the government's energy statistics and break them down by usage. Because the government's energy statistics are given in physical terms and you then have to say, where does this uh, fuel end up being used? So you can, you have to account for the fossil fuel that's used in electricity generation. Um, all these stations have got to be replaced by non-fossil one. You then have to look at the fossil energy used for process heat and domestic heat. And if you assume there's no improvement in heat efficiency, um, then the figures which the government gives in millions of tons of oil can be translated directly into electricity gigawatt hours. Because if you're not going to heat your house with gas, you're likely to switch to electric heating. Now, there may be efficiencies, obviously, with better, better thermal insulation, perhaps the use of heat, pipe, heat pumps and things. But as a first order of approximation, you're going to have the process heat will have to come from electricity. So that if you have a, a cooking process in um, a industrial food preparation plant, instead of heating the, 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 the boilers up with um, gas, you're going to heat them up with electricity. And then you look at the fossil energy used for transport. And there, you have to scale it down a bit because diesel engines and car petrol engines are inefficient and therefore they use up more energy in the form of oil than would be needed in the form of electricity. And you can scale that down to take that into account. As I said, the government gives its energy statistics in terms of millions of tons of oil equivalent. And a million tons of oil is a huge amount of energy. It's 11,000 gigawatt hours. Now, but as I say, one gigawatt hour of electricity is not equivalent to one gigawatt hour of energy from oil because thermodynamically they're different. The energy from oil is just heat. Energy from electricity is useful mechanical energy. And when you're calculating how much extra electricity is going to be needed for transport, you have to scale it down. I'm, I scale down by 35%, which I guess is about the mean between the diesel engines used for trucks, which are relatively high efficient, and the 
petrol engines used in most cars, which are less efficient. Britain used 8.5 million tonnes of oil equivalent of coal, 68 million tonnes of oil directly, and 75 million tonnes of oil equivalent in the form of natural gas. If you subtract the oil equivalent used in the, in the electricity industry, we get this column, which is the amount of oil or oil equivalent used for transport, process, heat and industrial and, and domestic heating. And I then convert that into the amount of extra electricity that would be needed, having broken it down behind the scenes into usage of oil for transport, process, heat, etc., breaking down how much of it goes to different uses and then applying appropriate efficiency conversion factors. So I get the, the total amount of new electricity that would be required if you completely removed all oil and gas fuel from the British economy and powered everything that's currently powered by oil and gas by electricity. For one year, you'd need roughly a petawatt hour of electricity, an extra petawatt hour of electricity to meet those requirements. And how many power stations are you going to need to replace these millions of barrels of oil? Um, we need one petawatt hour of electricity, you remember. And power stations are rated in megawatts. So we need to convert the megawatts, which is the peak number of joules per second that a power station can, can yield, into gigawatt hours per year, which is a different unit. And it's not just a matter of the amount of time involved, because different power stations have different load factors. Power stations very rarely run at their maximum load factor. They, they have to some extra margin, and the extra margin is much higher for wind power than it is for nuclear power, for example. If you look at the actual installed capacity of power stations in Britain, and you look at the number of gigawatt hours yielded by different types of power stations. You see that there is a very big difference in the number of gigawatt hours per year that we were produced per each gigawatt installed, depending on the type you have. If you look at renewables, each gigawatt of installed wind turbines gave 1,700 gigawatt hours a year of electricity. If you look at the nuclear power plants, each gigawatt of installed nuclear power plant gave 65, um, 6,500 gigawatt hours. The big difference, obviously, is that the wind doesn't blow steadily all the time, whereas nuclear stations can deliver power continuously. The CC, that, that's com, combined cycle gas thermal stations, the, the type that I had the diagram of before, they're relatively high uh, yield, better than the conventional steam ones. So there is a big difference in the amount of plant you need to produce a petawatt hour, depending on how you produce it. So you've got to choose what, what's going to be built. If we just look at the ratios that Britain currently uses of nuclear versus wind, the current installed capacity, you would need to build 68 gigawatts of new nuclear power stations and 333 gigawatts of new wind power. That's the extra capacity that the country is going to need to drive its transport, heating, etc. If, on the other hand, you went all one way or all the other, you could do it by installing 155 gigawatts of nuclear power or 600 gigawatts of wind power. 
Now, just to get a handle on these figures, building a single three gigawatt power station at Hinkley Point has been a huge saga for, for the British government since they sold off the electricity industry and lost the ability to build their own nuclear power stations. The, the picture here shows a nuclear power station built in the 1960s in Wales. In the background, there is actually a hydro station just above it. And that was all domestic engineering technology. At the moment, after Thatcher's privatisation, the, the British engineering industry lost the ability to build nuclear power stations, so they have to go to other countries where the state still runs the, the electrical power industry, like France and China, and get the French and Chinese to build the stations. And it's been, as I say, a huge saga to get a single three gigawatt power plant built. And you're actually going to need a minimum, just in the current ratio, um, you're going to need 20 times 20 of those plants. If you go all nuclear, well, how, how much are you going to need? You need 50 of those plants. You get an, an in, inkling of the scale of the problem. How much is it going to cost? Well, there are different types of nuclear and different types of wind plants. The uh, standard way of building nuclear power stations now is to build very large pressurized water reactors. These ones I show you here are medium-sized gas-cooled ones, which is what Britain mass-produced, or not mass-produced, but produced a lot of in the 50s and 60s. But the current standard is to produce very big pressurized water reactors. There is a movement to try and develop small modular pressurized water reactors, which are hopefully going to be a lot cheaper. Then in the case of wind, there's a choice between onshore wind farms and offshore wind farms. Onshore wind farms meet a lot of objections because of noise, um, being unsightly, etc. So the, there's a move by the British government to site most of its big wind power stations offshore, but offshore is, is a lot more expensive. So the total costs of decarbonisation are going to differ according to which of these options are chosen. If we go for the all nuclear option and use large reactors based on the Hinkley Point experience of what the cost is, that's £971 billion it's going to cost to build the reactors. If we go for an open source design of small nuclear reactor, that can probably be brought down to about £300 billion. If we go for offshore wind farms and taking the, the costing data from the US Department of Energy, that would cost us, would cost Britain about £17 billion. What, sorry, 1 trillion 748 billion. If it's onshore, it's 568 billion. So there's a big range of costs according to the technology chosen. I mentioned there the small modular reactor, and I'm taking the data from the Open 100 open source design for nuclear reactors. Um, this is a 100 megawatt standardized factory produced reactor. If you're interested in it, you can download CAD mod models for each part of the power plant. The claimed advantages of it is that standardization will reduce design costs since there's one design. It doesn't have to be designed every time a new plant is built. It's reduced even further by making it an open source design so that the companies producing it or the countries producing it don't have to pay royalties on the design. And the, since there'll be multiple producers, they're able to, able to make identical reactors in factories, facilitating mass production. And we've got to bear in mind, huge number of reactors are going to have to be produced. And we also have to bear in mind that these are only projected costings. There are several schemes to build these small modular reactors. Rolls-Royce is also planning to build them based on the reactors it currently produces for nuclear uh, warships, but the 
lower figures should be treated with some caution because we don't yet have experience of the mass production of such reactors. So if we look at these figures, hundreds and hundreds of billions of pounds, how does that compare with the current rate of capital accumulation in Britain? If you look at the UK accounts, and everything I was doing was for 2018, the UK had a gross capital formation of 381 billion. Now, that's a large sum of money, and it makes these decarbonisation things seem quite feasible. But if you then look at another column, you see that capital consumption, I have to say depreciation, was 331 billion. So that the net formation of new fixed capital was only 50 billion. And you then take away the net capital formation in new houses and look at the capital formation in industry, net capital formation in industry, and it was only 35 billion. And then you then focus down further, further to the electricity industry and its gross capital formation, let alone net capital formation, its gross capital formation was only 10 billion. Now, depending on the technologies, the costs of decarbonisation are going to be between 300 billion and 1750 billion roughly. And let's take a mid-range, around a thousand billion. And assume that it's going to be spent over a 16-year period. Perhaps it could be spent over a 30-year period. If it's spent over a 16-year period, it means you're going to have to need of the order of 60 billion a year invested just in new electric generators. And that's more than the net capital formation for the whole economy. And it's six times the current gross capital formation of the privatised electricity industry. In summary, what I'm saying is there's a relatively short time horizon to end CO2 emissions. And it'll involve replacing existing power stations and building up a huge amount of new electrical capacity to replace the oil and gas used. The investments would be order of 60 billion a year. And I'm not including all the extra investment that has to go into replacing the vehicle stock of the country. The extra investment that industries are going to have to make to replace gas powered heating with electric heating. Masses of investment throughout the economy. I'm just focusing on the electricity investment. Now, the scale of that development is such that only a nationalised energy sector would carry it out. Thatcher experimented with privatising the electricity industry. The net result has been a prolonged period of relatively low investment and the loss of the technological capacity to build nuclear power stations. And there's essentially no chance that the free market economics will induce this level of investment. It can only be either enforced by, this, by some form of state planning, state regulation of power generation, which obviously in, is increasingly involved in the existing degree to which fossil fuel use has dec declined, but it's unlikely that private capital will come up with the money for it because the rate of return on capital is too low. We have just seen that a second large power, nuclear power station that was planned in Wales to go next to one of those old Magnox ones at Wilfa. Two or three large consortiums have pulled out of the plan to build that because the rate of return on capital is too low. Capitalist class do not like large capital investment projects. The organic composition of capital in such activity is low. Is, sorry, organic composition is very high and as a result the rate of profit is low. And therefore it can only really be achieved by state direction. And all this, all this is just the electricity cost. It's before we even consider the effect 
of investment that's going to be needed because of rising sea levels. Because the sea levels are going to rise. Roads are going to be, and transport links, have got to be removed away from low-lying territory. Cities on low-lying uh, land have got to be evacuated and rebuilt on higher land. Ports have got to be moved upriver, away from um, areas that will flood. These are huge investments again. And if left to the private sector, they're not going to happen. 